the uh, Mr. Shabbat. Thank you. Uh, Director Ray, since you last testified before this committee, our country has faced increased uh, threats, be it malware and ransomware to our computer networks, uh, gang members crossing our southern border and committing horrific crimes here within the United States, uh, groups like Antifa attempting to burn down federal courthouses, the January 6th attack, as we've mentioned, on the Capitol, and the surge of illicit drugs killing so many Americans, we are facing multiple national security threats, uh, all of which need the full attention of agencies uh, like the one that you oversee, the FBI. Um, I'll first ask you about uh, cyber attacks. Ransomware terrorists have brazenly uh, disrupted the operations of countless hospitals, schools, city governments, emergency services, even our congressional offices, and an untold number of businesses because uh, they typically pay the ransom uh, quietly. Uh, last fall, cyber criminals were able to compromise patient records and personal information from a hospital in a se senior living community uh, in my district. Uh, and more recently, high-profile ransomware attacks on Colonial Pipeline and JBS uh, meat processing company uh, caused major disruptions uh, to our oil and food supply. Um, I've seen it estimated that there is a victim of a ransomware attack every 11 seconds, uh, that they're already costing us $20 billion a year, and that you've compared uh, the challenge, uh, as Mr. Cohen mentioned, to the September 11th. 2001 attack on our nation. Um, Mr. Director, um, the Biden administration, uh, basically, I mentioned the, uh, the attack on, on the colonial pipeline, uh, basically gave a, a wink and a nod uh, to paying off uh, the thugs. Um, and I know some of that money uh, was, was uh, gotten back, but don't we need to, uh, uh, to clarify uh, are the policy relative to paying off uh, criminals? Aren't we just inviting uh, more attacks uh, when you pay off these thugs? Well, Congressman, I appreciate the question, uh, and I, I share your concern about, uh, and that's partly why I've made some of the comments that I've made publicly about the effect of ransomware and the threat that it poses and the challenge and what it requires from all of us to deal with it. It is our policy, it is our guidance uh, from the FBI that uh, companies should not pay the ransom uh, for a number of reasons. One, the one that you mentioned, which is that it encourages more of this kind of activity. But then there's second, some more practical issues, which sometimes the, the encryption or the locking up of the system that the actors engage in um, may not be undone. You could pay the ransom and not get your system back, and that's not unknown to, to happen. Uh, but the third and the most important thing is whether the company pays or not, what we really need is to make sure that the companies uh, or, or other organizations who are victimized uh, reach out and coordinate with the FBI and with our partners as quickly and promptly as possible. And it's when they do that enables us to take all sorts of creative action that we can't always do, but that certain cases we can, and speed matters, which is why, for example, in the colonial instance, we were able to essentially uh, seize and confiscate the clear majority of the ransom that was extracted. In other cases, again, not common, but it does happen, we're able to actually uh, get the encryption keys and unlock the, uh, the system even without the company paying the ransom. And so the whole bunch of things we can do to prevent this activity from occurring if, whether they pay the ransom or not, they communicate and coordinate and work closely with law enforcement right out of the gate. That's, I think, is the most important part. Thank you, Mr. Director. I, I got two more questions. I only have time for one. Um, the Centers for uh, Disease Control announced that there's been an increase in overdose deaths. Uh, uh, the prevalence of fentanyl is, is the main thing. Comes from China, comes across uh, our southern border. Um, myself, I, and Bob Latta have introduced legislation relative to fentanyl analogs, uh, which are very similar, can be changed. They get around the law with that. Um, but my question to you is relative to, to fentanyl and the analogs as well. Um, the chaos at our southern border, doesn't this play right into the, uh, the, the drug uh, cartels, our, the, the current policies down there on the southern border, isn't more of that drug coming in and 
killing far too many Americans. Don't we really need to control that southern border? Well, I, I absolutely agree that the security situation at the southwest border is of great concern, um, both from a perspective of drug trafficking, human trafficking, uh, violence on both sides of the border, corruption, uh, et cetera. Uh, and certainly we are trying to do our part to contribute to that uh, because, as you mentioned, the, uh, the scourge of opioids, opioid abuse, fentanyl in particular, um, is something that is sweeping the country. And I know that in your home state, that's a particularly significant concern. Uh, we, from our end, are trying to attack the problem through a variety of means. We're going after not just the, uh, the professionals, the prescribers from that end of it. We're going after the dark web where it's trafficked there. We're going after the gangs that contribute, uh, distribute it here locally. We're going after the source through our, our uh, transnational organized crime efforts. Um, so there's a whole bunch of things that we're doing with our partners, but make no mistake, this goes beyond, way beyond law enforcement into other agencies and, and uh, frankly, the community as well. Gentlemen's time is expired. The gentleman uh, yields back. Mr. Ray was uh, fr flat out lying right there. And the, and the fact is, uh, he is an incompetent director. He was not qualified for this job. I think I'm you know, a huge Trump supporter, but I think it was one of the biggest mistakes uh, of the Trump presidency was putting Christopher Ray in there. And uh, I think he showed it, especially in this, his opening remarks that he made today, how biased he actually is. Because everything that he said, especially about extremist violence, was completely sided to the left. Everything that had to do with any type of group that calls themselves patriots or anything that happened on January 6th was noted and, and displayed by his language as something that is far extreme with very little, if any, people that were there that, to be peaceful. And he made it sound as though the left is mostly peaceful with just a few things. Everything that comes out of this guy's mouth is pushed to the left, but it's subtle. So if you've been you know, a prosecutor or a, a U.S. attorney, or if you've been in the FBI and you listen to his language, you can literally see this. And I, I, and I think some of these congressmen and congresswomen actually saw this today, and I think they went after him, but he's not going to bend as far as that goes. I will tell you that I have spoken directly to FBI agents that are investigating January 6th, you know, um, issues, and ranging from individuals that uh, were in the Capitol to individuals who were not in the Capitol. One, one thing that stands out, the, the, the most recent conversation I had with an FBI, FBI agent here in Salt Lake indicated he said he's never seen anything like this. They are given a mandate. They are to go out. They have been given the questions they're supposed to be asking. They have been given the way they're supposed to proceed on this case. They don't have individualized authority. It is all coming from Washington, D.C. I've spoken to prosecutors that are prosecuting these cases. And this is not individualized justice. They are lumping everybody into the same category and they are treating them uh, like, un unlike I've ever seen in a case. Uh, the Department of Justice is supposed to address every single case, unless it's a conspiracy case, according to the criminal conduct of that individual. They're not doing that. None of the prosecutors mm -hmm. have authority. It's all coming straight from Washington, D.C. There is so much energy put towards these people, and there's not the same energy put towards Antifa. Why didn't he explain that? Why couldn't he explain that? Well, I don't think he could explain it because, again, he was making this into uh, more of a political uh, stand. And, you know, he, he said there were three categories of people on January 6th. He failed to completely mention the people who were literally invited into uh, the Capitol building by the, the Capitol Police. And the majority of the people that were there did nothing. It, he made it sound as though if you came on the Capitol grounds, you were an extremist. And that is just not the case. There were some violent people there. There were some people that went into the Capitol that did some very nefarious things. But his category, uh, the way he categorized these people was absolutely wrong. And the way that the FBI has systematically as uh, Brett just uh, pointed out there, been told how to investigate January 6th, they've systematically been kept from truly investigating or going after the leftists. And that is so clear because of the way that there's just nothing going down about these individuals on the left. And I'll, I'll just say one other thing. In all my time in the FBI, the only white supremacist case that I ever saw, and I was in New York the entire time, was prison-related. 
There was no white supremacy, uh, massive uh, agenda going on in the United States, and it's not happening now. And it's another example of how they use these things and push them out in the media. When you think about what Antifa did last summer, the number of federal properties that they destroyed um, or defaced, and the money that they caused to small businesses, the, the, the police officers who they injured, the Secret Service members, they really haven't been held accountable to the same type of behavior that they did all last summer. Why not? They have not been. I mean, you think about what domestic terrorism is. When you burn down a police station and you take over city blocks, that's domestic terrorism. And they have not been held accountable. Uh, I'm ashamed to, to say that, you know, my, my former office, you know, the Department of Justice, I, I wish I could see courage. I wish I, I could see U.S. attorneys standing up. You know, it's interesting. I, I represent an individual who... Um, went into the Capitol, um, was told she could go in, and was actually pointed by a security guard to the direction she should go. And she's being prosecuted. She's being charged with uh, misdemeanors. She, she has no criminal history. She thought the only other Capitol she's ever been in is a state Capitol that's open 24-7. She thought you could walk in. She, so there's a, there's a wide disparity a, a, between, you know, who Chris Ray is identifying and they want to prosecute every single person that was there to send a message. And that's what this is. It's message prosecuting. And, and, and that's mm -hmm. never a, a, an appropriate decision by a prosecutor.